Welcome to Reflecting Light. This podcast is about feeling the world with light by exploring myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the works of artists, past and present, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And now, here is your host, Mandy Green. All right, my beautiful listeners, today is a super exciting day because we are joined by the one and only Jared Rubalcaba, who's actually my fellow guide in our tour with Forbidden Adventure of, what's the name of our tour even? Forbidden Egypt, probably. (laughs) Dang it, what tour guides are we? All right, well, Jared is amazing and This company was born from the two of us and our friend Marie, who finally convinced us to go out to Egypt and see some of the things we'd all been studying together. And I have to say, even though I knew what was there and I had an idea, it's absolutely nothing compared to being in the presence of it, in the face of it. And that's kind of how this all started. Egypt's all about, well, I'll let Jared talk about the male femaleness, but Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks. Jared's a G. He's great. And so I've asked him to come on because he's really, I would say, pretty much an expert on Egypt. He'll balk at that. But he's a wonderful teacher. He teaches a class on my online school on Project Illumination called Esoteric Egypt. And if any of the things we talk about today are speaking to your soul, his class is amazing. He even does like effects and zoom ins and zoom outs. Like he's the real, he's the real pro, but Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mandy. What got you started in Egypt? Where did this hunger begin and and how has it gotten? It seems to grow with you that it becomes more of an insatiable hunger. And it's just this beautiful thing that you continue to pursue. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah. Well, for me, it began with my first encounter with Joseph Smith and the Pearl of Great Price and the uh, facsimiles in there and the incredible images that that are there and the the meaning that's there and the depth that's there and this idea just intuitively understanding that, hey, there's a lot more to this. And and I'd I'd really like to delve in. I want to be able to see what's there. And, you know, there's the surface, but then there's what's beneath that and, and trying to find more there and then encountering Joseph Smith and his preoccupation with Egypt and his interest in Egypt. And then of course, I mean, it goes all the way back, right? We've got, <clears throat> we've got Abraham, right? In Egypt, both learning and uh, teaching the Egyptians, right? This exchange of information. We've got Jacob in Egypt. We have Joseph, right? Joseph and Asenath. I mean, the, the parents of Ephraim and Manasseh. So if, if those are important to you, I mean, my goodness. Their parents, Joseph, second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. His wife, Asenath, Nibley makes the uh, case that she was most likely a priestess of Neith, right? Asenath, Asenath. Neith then would be one of the many titles for a, a heavenly mother figure, the highest goddess, queen of heaven. And um, her dad being a high, the high priest of Heliopolis, right? So you've got Ephraim and Manasseh. My goodness, talk about a stacked deck, right? Their 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 grandparents, their grandfathers. One is 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 Israel, right, and the other is the high priest of Heliopolis. So yeah, I mean that's that's fascinating. And then of course Moses, being an Egyptian prince, Christ Himself spending his his childhood in Egypt, and it just goes on and on, right? You talk about Plato and Pythagoras. Herodotus, Plutarch, I mean, all of them credit Egypt as, as integral to their education. And so clearly there's, there's something there. There's a phrase in the Old Testament that treasures hidden in the sand. It always makes me think of Egypt that way. And it's a place for, for memory. When we talk about Egypt in terms of why Egypt from like an academic standpoint, they call it the, uh, you know, the, the Cambridge School, right? Because decades ago, it, it kind of originates and has promoted this, this viewpoint by Cambridge of, of patternism or diffusionism. This idea that 
at one time, there was this long before recorded memory, there was one truth, right? One religion, the, the Prisca Sapientia, right? That, that first wisdom or first religion. And then from there, it just fragments and it you know, spreads across the globe. And it sort of explains the surprising similarities that we find uh, all, all over the place, right? And in religions, cultures, beliefs, everywhere, in particular ritual. So you'll see the same concepts and the ideas that underlie, you know, that, that are the foundation, especially if you just become a little flexible with terms, right? They'll, they'll repackage it with different names, but it's the same things. And, and so you can't help but see that. And it's like, yeah, these pieces of one great whole that you can kind of reassemble. And the idea is then to go as far back as you can, just like a river. Right? You've got this clean water coming from the source, right, from the spring, and then it trickles down and maybe gets diluted and muddied as it goes further on. Well, we're trying to get as far back as we can, as close as we can to that undiluted source, right, that, that pure spring. And so that's kind of what that approach is in terms of getting as far back as you can. And it was uh, Hugh Nibley that said that by far the best view uh, of the big picture can be had in Egypt. So that's, that's why Egypt, those are literally the <laughs> oldest religious texts in the world. And, and right back to the very beginning, the oldest ones that we have, they concern man's divine heritage, right? They, they concern this idea of, of leaving the earth and returning back to a heavenly home, of being reunited with a family of gods and, and taking your place alongside of them becoming like them right from right from jump street they get that going thank you i loved your explanation of going back to the source it's really important for me it kind of was the same thing i would start i started studying hebrew and then i started studying greek and then i thought wow we've got to go even further back and what i love about egypt is for me it offers the most comprehensive view of this family of gods and goddesses that are at work on my behalf on the, and on the behalf of every single member of that family. And when I left there, I just felt the first time I just felt this tremendous support and they all have these different roles and these different titles. And as we try to uncover in particular, so, you know, my emphasis is the divine feminine Wow, if, if you want to learn about some of the attributes and characteristics of a divine mother or her daughters, Egypt is the place for you because that trail has been erased or destroyed or tampered with so much that showing up in our current time and place, I feel like a caveman. I'm over here, Unga Bunga, trying to knock two rocks together and figure out what a salvific path for a woman would look like. And I love that Egypt offers me some, some insight into that and these different aspects of a goddess that are represented maybe by different names or different animals or different persona, which are all representative of her. But I love that they isolate certain aspects of her so that I can tune into these beautiful things. So would you talk a little bit about how the gods are represented that they don't worship animals. I mean, let's give us like the Egypt 101, Jared. I know it's really hard. Jared's really, really versed in this, but he's a really great teacher. So I, I trust that he'll be able to give us just a little bit of a breakdown of maybe why these certain aspects are used and why they isolate different characteristics to help you understand. Because when you understand, you really are able to draw closer to someone. For me, it's just been the most sacred edifying, empowering, beautiful journey. Yeah, I, I mean, that was incredibly well said. That search for Heavenly Mother was very much a part of, of my impetus to begin study, to begin research, just in general, right? To try to find more, like you said, to feel closer to her, right? To, to reestablish this connection, just innately knowing that she's there and wanting to understand more so that you can be pulled into contact with her, right? That contact with the, with the familiar, with this mother that, that your spirit remembers. My goodness, so much, like you said, this resurgence, right? So much is, is, is coming to light nowadays, particularly through a re-examination of the Hebrew 
text, like you, like you mentioned, pioneered, of course, by Margaret Barker, right? It has to be said. I mean, the woman, the woman, such an inspired, brilliant woman, right? I have just tremendous respect for her. Uh, I can't even articulate. But at, at the same time, though, you find yourself just having to to work so hard, or at least that was my experience approaching it that way through the Hebrew text or Greek text in terms of just working so hard and parsing every word and dissecting every phrase. And you you strain merely to justify your belief in a heavenly mother, much less, you know, get some tidbits. I don't want to minimize what's achieved that way, but in Egypt, it's, it's, it's another thing altogether. Yeah. You're, you're looking at a breadcrumb trail that's been picked apart by the wild animals of the forest. And in Egypt, it's candy yellow brick road that just leads you right (laughs) to grandma's house almost. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, she's front and center, right? Like you can't, you can't avoid the goddess in Egypt. You, You literally can't. I mean, she's on every wall. She's pivotal to every text. She's indispensable to every ritual that's performed. You don't have her. You, you ain't got nothing, Jack. Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, she, she's it. And so you find in Egypt so much more about her and her daughters, right? And, and her priestesses and their role, because it is front and center. It is critical, right? And so you see this I mean, she's the beautiful one. So, so you get her beauty in Egypt. You get her power. In fact, that's even one of the names of her when we talk about Sekhmet as a role, as, as a name for Heavenly Mother. It's literally the feminized form of power. That's her name, power. One of her, one of her many names. <laughs> power, love, beauty, tenderness, right? She's nurturing. She's depicted just incredibly tenderly nurturing her children. And also ferocity, right? Yeah. When when called for. <laughs> yeah. 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 It destroys this line that I abhor so much about her being protected by her husband. I'm like, I what is that movie? I would not say such things if I were you. Oh, it's Princess Bride, right? It's yeah. I, once you come face to face with Sekhmet, I would not say such things if I were you. In fact, I think her husband kind of sits back and is like oh you guys just you're in trouble now maybe he thinks it's pretty rad that she could just yeah, open it up <laughs> you're right in, in Egypt you actually find the the reverse that, that she's the protectress you know we're all familiar with that cobra right the uraeus that's I mean that's her that's the goddess she's protecting and, and as you said though okay maybe this begins or or it's triggered by a search for heavenly mother but what I love about Egypt is the balance like you were just saying, Absolutely. I mean, you do not have a mother without a father. You don't have a father without a mother. And we've talked about a, a number of times before, just the wonderful iconography of Isis and Osiris, the, you know, the, the couple, the ultimate couple that we all pattern ourselves after, right. And, and try to follow their example and become one with them. Isis, her name is the throne. Like that's, That's her iconography. She's got that on top of her head, that little throne. And that's how you spell her name. And then Osiris is made by the throne. His name is the I to make, to create, to achieve with the throne, right? So it's an indispensable element in both of their names. And you'll see her behind him on the throne, not not as less than by any means. She put him on the throne, right? So... Without Osiris, you know, Isis just has her empty throne. And without her, he's got no throne. They have to achieve it together. And they move up and ascend together and achieve this glorification together. It's, it's, there is no star God without his companion, the pyramid text say, right? It's, wow, that's it's, so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It is so beautiful and it's so complete. And I, I think these love stories are inside of us. Something inside of us speaks to this. And it's so sad that it was lost. And yet as an individual, Jared and I, well, as individuals, English becomes hard when you start going into other languages. But as individuals, we're here to say that you can still uncover this. You can find this for yourself. This is out there for you to learn and study and get back to. And there's something about 
what is taught and shown in Egypt that just speaks deeper than words. It's just, it resonates with your soul. Nothing more so than that beautiful story of Isis and Osiris and her deathless ability to, I mean, last of the Mohicans times infinity, like say, I will find you. Right. And his, <laughs> his trust and love of her and his ability to redeem everyone as a result of that love. It's just amazing. It's so amazing. Jared, would you pick one example of how animals are used? Like for Osiris, I'm thinking of Sokar or Sekhmet is the lioness or Hathor or Amun, whatever. They all kind of are depicted by an animal because they're representing a particular attribute of that animal that they want to highlight. So would you pick one or two and and demonstrate to our listeners how that's achieved? Yeah, yeah, for sure. As you said that earlier, that's often a very oversimplified mischaracterization of the Egyptians, right? That they worshiped animals or that they worshiped the sun. That is a very drastic mischaracterization and oversimplification. It's so much more than that. And the animals are just a um, a symbol. They're an expression of a divine quality that the gods have. And so it's being illustrated by this animal. Their, their language is the same way. All of these things, you know, they talk about their language being given to them from the gods. And it is, it's, it's symbol, it's symbolic. Like you were saying, it goes beyond expression. And, and the, the animals are some, the same way. So when they reflect qualities of the gods, or if the language has some really interesting connections and, and coincidences in it, they don't see it that way as a coincidence. They see it as revealing um, a hidden truth, some underlying connection that otherwise may have been missed. So it's the same with animals. For instance, Horus, the god Horus, he's the falcon or the hawk. I would explain Horus as a glorified being, right? One who's been resurrected and glorified and he is victorious. He is first and foremost, a warrior. He's shown sailing across the cosmos, pursuing Set or, or Set. Uh, that's the Satan figure, okay? The, uh, the rebel against God, the agent of chaos. And Horus is pursuing him with, by the way, with his followers, those who follow Horus or accompany him. They're chasing him down, you know, in an effort to spread light and, and promote that in defense of the father and the father's plan. So uh, Horus is the hawk. You'll see him either depicted as a hawk or as a man with a hawk head. And, and that was, is not meant to be taken literally, but to express those qualities about him. So, you know, for instance, then you just start looking at the hawk, these outstretched wings and its dappled belly, these dappled feathers, almost like a starry sky or the heavens itself. And you think of these hawks that just circling ever higher, piercing the heavens, going where we can, ascending, often in a, uh, in a spiral, right? They're, they're, they're doing these concentric rings as they go higher. Well, one of his titles as that hawk is, is uh, sharp of sight, foremost of sight, right? He, he's far seeing. That hawk that's up there searching for prey or what have you, he is foremost of sight. He's so far seeing. He can see things past and future, right? It's all laid before him. And so he's got the broad perspective that hopefully we're trying to tap into, right? Yes. And wisdom from, and, but also as a warrior, right? That hawk silent and swift can just dive at incredible speeds, right? To strike its prey. And so you talk about, you know, coming like a thief in the night or something, you know, <laughs> something along those lines. I mean, that's absolutely goes hand in hand with that idea of the, the falcon or the hawk for Horus. So, and that's just, a, that's just jumping off, right? That's just a starting place. Yeah. It goes and, and that's what's so wonderful about it. All of the symbols are like that. Their language, the hieroglyphic language is symbols. It's built on symbols. I often say like, it's a language that's not so much translated, but interacted with. You have to experience, hence going to Egypt, right? Like you can see them, but then to stand there in a temple that's completely covered in these symbols. I mean, it's, it is something you have to experience. And we are confined to language, right? That's the tool that we have. So 
So we have to start somewhere, right? And we say, okay, here's some things that work for this symbol, right? This symbol is this, and it's this, and it's this. They're, they're polysemic, I say, right? They, they express multiple meanings at one time. That's the beauty of the symbol. Don't fall into the trap of being like, you know, A equals B. This is this. Yeah. It's so tempting and it's so comforting. To, <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly what that is. But that's missing the point. If it was just this, you wouldn't even need the symbol. You could just say that, right? Yeah. So these symbols, like, yeah, you start off with some meanings, but ultimately, I mean, you really do. I, you feel it. You experience it. It's it's the language of God. I love how you describe that. So, Jared, I was, I'm trying to learn a few little symbols, and Jared was showing me something, and I remember just saying, this is this, and felt like the seagull. This is this, that is that, and the little mermaid. But he's always there to caution you, saying, yes, and, and, yeah. and he taught me this beautiful lesson that there's something about being in the face of the symbol. And much of our religious, old religious texts and rites and ordinances involve symbol. But he said, when I condense it down to language, you're just going to see the word. You'll never know that it's the Sen ring or, you know, one of these beautiful loaded symbols. And that's the danger of translation with Egyptian is that, well, with anything, I know you've read some of my Hebrew texts. I have eight words as possibilities because I, refuse to tie it down to one possibility. And I think the older we go back, the more possibility there is. And in the Western world, we've become so handicapped by trying to be very didactic about our approach and very, I've got to nail this down and this fits into this. I had one opportunity as I was talking to one of our guests on the tour, she was talking about putting stuff. So is this Moses? Is this Joseph? And I just said, rather than trying to throw those pieces into your box, take your box and just throw it up into the sky and see how what you have fits into this greater cosmic view. And that's the most beautiful, important thing I think that we could do as instructors is say, take what's in your box. And rather than trying to confine, especially with with Egypt, as you just said, we don't want to try and box it up and say, here's how it's packaged. Jared's so good to always say it's more than that. It's more than that. It depends on what's before and after it. And so with Egypt, just take some of these things and take your box of meaning and what you know, which is absolutely amazing, but throw it up into this big cosmic view. And then you'll see Egypt just start connecting those dots and those dots fill to like other dots. And you start seeing this, this glorious cosmic panorama that you're not going to see anywhere else. I really haven't been able to find it. And the beautiful part for me is that by understanding Egypt, all of a sudden the Old Testament makes a lot more sense to me because the Old Testament is heavily, when you understand how that all comes in and then that the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, I promise these threads pull through. Boy, when you put that Egypt skein on there, You could pull that thread. Well, I'm still pulling. I don't know about you, Jared. He's studied a lot more than I have, and he's still pulling a lot. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's gold, man. You you find gold in Egypt for sure. You're like this prospector, and you just yeah, you find a vein of gold, and you keep going. Yeah, I mean, we talked about like why Egypt, right? Like, okay, and I broke down some of the academic stuff, pearl of great price, etc. And that's what brought me there. But like, why do I keep going back? It's because of what I find. It's like I said, it's a place of recognition and remembrance. And when we talk about that source, that following the the river right to those clear waters. Yeah. Okay. There's study and there's research and there's all that, but you know, that's trivia. (laughs) If you don't confirm those things with the actual source, with the real source, with the true source, right? That's the, the fount that you're trying to get to, that fount of every blessing, right? That, 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 those clear waters, that spring of righteousness and truth, that's what you're trying to get to. And there's this, it's like paradoxically the most ancient part of you and yet the most childlike part of you, right? That, that's just so deep. That's so perfectly said. 
<laughs> it's just so deep inside of you and it existed long before you know this earth was ever created and that part of you can remember those once familiar truths that part of you recognizes and remembers and so that's that's why I keep going back to Egypt. I keep recognizing things. I keep remembering things. And it gives you the answers. It gives you the questions, even better said, actually. It gives yeah. you the questions to take to the Lord and, 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 to, and to find out from, you know, an undiluted source. That's what I see there, that familiarity. And, you know, apparently Joseph Smith did too. Yes, I understand that Joseph Smith is riddled with all kinds of, well, it says your name will be had for good and for evil. And I don't think he gets a fair shake because we have this present tensism. But more than that, I did a lot of search and study about Joseph Smith. And if you're one of our le- our listeners who's not part of this tradition, I would beg you to hear me out about this. Dead men tell no tales. His life was cut short. And, and who knows what actually occurred and what actually happened That's been my answer. But the fact that those three facsimiles are in the back of a pearl of great price, published, shown, sought after, blows my mind. There's nobody in Christendom who has pulled that Egyptian thread but him. And the three that he included are basically the journey of mankind. It is the entire picture And so say what you will, nobody else has even come close to that type of revelation and thought and desire to help and inspire others in their journey back to God. And what I love most about him is his vision and his work was, I think it's been kind of switched up to say, we're just going to ride on his coattails. But I always feel his voice in my heart saying, no, I I want you to have your own experience with the divine. I don't want you to take mine and live off of it. I want you to have your own experience with the divine and learn and be taught from heaven. That's so critical. That's critical to everything we're talking about is that you come to this with your heart and your spirit and you ask heaven to teach you. And then you start reading nibbly like crazy. (laughs) What would you say to someone who? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. That most religious traditions are going to have some sort of prophet or an example of somebody who's ascended or gone up and received higher knowledge. And that's fantastic, right? You can get so much uh, from that. But I, one of the most valuable things that you get from that is the faith that you can do it yourself, that, that now you have the impetus to go out and, and acquire those sorts of experience and that knowledge for yourself, because that's ultimately all that's going to matter. And, you know, Joseph Smith has you know, informed and aided invaluably my understanding of the Egyptian. And I also bring my own Christian tradition into that, right? And, and, and I see Christ there. I see Mary Magdalene. You know, I see all of these things there. But I want to stress too, like you said, that's, it's, that's not required. If you have baggage with, with any of those things, that, that's okay. You can let that go Absolutely. and approach Egypt with, with fresh eyes, right? And, and just take it on its own terms. You don't have to do that. And I mean, I've seen that. I've seen people who have baggage with Christianity and, and with things around that. And that's, that's okay. Fine. You don't have to draw these parallels. You can approach Osiris and Isis on their own terms, just as, as they are, and, and find meaning and connection there. And that those same principles of memory and recognition hold just as strong, right? It's just as true and just as powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of our guests on our last tour had this quote from Mary Ann Rodmacher that said, I am not the same having seen the moon shine on the other side of the world. We're going to include her reading a poem she wrote while she was out in Egypt with us called The Initiate, which is just beautiful. Even if you don't understand the references to the places and the characters she's speaking of, I would just ask you to open your heart to the soul of, of what's being said. But Jared, what would you say to that? I am not the same having seen the moon shine on the other side of the world. What's the value of actually interfacing with these things that you studied for so many years? The most frustrating question that people who are on our tours, when they come home, the most frustrating thing in the world is now to try to 
express <laughs> this experience, right? How is Egypt? You know, people are yeah. Looking, you know, we, right. the people that come on our tours, it, it's different too. Like our tour is different. If, if you just want a s- selfie in front of the Sphinx, this is maybe not the place for you, right? It's we're, we're we're like searching and we're 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 striving to connect and and to connect dots, like you said, and to pull threads. And context is everything. You know that from translating, from delving into any of these sacred texts, context is everything. Context being what's with the text, right? What goes along with that? And that's part of the frustration of trying to explain uh, your adventures in Egypt, right? Because they're missing the context. And we, you want to say, oh, you had to be there. Well, <laughs> you really did. I mean, that's not just a cop out. It's be, we say that not because it, without that, you are missing all of the context, everything that goes along with that. The heat of the Egyptian sun, <laughs> right? the smells of, of, of the Middle Eastern spices, of, you know, the, the sound of the reeds on the bank of the Nile, right? The sand beneath your feet, all of that, the thousands of tons of, or hundreds of thousands of tons in some cases of stone that's above your head, you know, as you're crouching through and climbing through the Great Pyramid, right? Traveling through these dark corridors and this sense of adventure and discovery that in a lot of ways is mirroring what happens in your own life, your own life journey of descent and moving upward, hopefully, you know, and of searching in the dark and clinging to and, and, and wanting the light, you know, desiring that. It, you're literally wrapped around. I mean, I think of the Pyramid of Unis where you have the pyramid texts, those, those most ancient sacred writings in the entire world. There's no images in that pyramid. You go in there and it's all just floor to ceiling texts. When we have translations of those, that's just one page after another, right? You get it's a linear, and you know we have to do that. You're bound by linguistics to have to do that, but that's not how it's experienced. You're standing there in this room where the walls matter, the locations of things matter, their placement matters, and you see this all over, not just in the pyramid texts and all of their temples everywhere. You see this like magical resonance right where things are bouncing around and what's on one side of the wall influences what's on the other side of the wall we're opposite on the room and how they it's it creates this symphony you know and these these beautiful harmonies that come together and you're standing there in the middle of it and you're the main character you're supposed to consider yourself as as adam you know and then eventually as osiris and then eventually glorified as Horus as you move on, right? So standing there, yeah, it's everything. And, and these 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 temples, these structures, these pyramids, they're all designed using, you know, the principles of sacred geometry, which is a whole other thing, right? Yeah. And influences you that way. And beyond that, I think that intention matters, not only what you bring, but what others have brought. I think that, um, and I've felt and experienced in other places, uh, cathedrals in Europe, uh, the most humble abbeys in France, right? Where for hundreds of years, you have a small cadre of people where their hearts are just completely devoted to trying to connect with the divine. And that sort of sincerity, that sort of intent, I believe firmly makes a mark on a place, like physically on a building, on a location, I think it makes a mark. And that's something that can be experienced when you go there. And hundreds of years, my goodness, in Egypt, we're now talking about that same concept spread over thousands of years and long before recorded history. The temples that we see in Egypt, they're almost all built on much more ancient sites, right? Where you have temple built upon temple going back to, like I said, long before (laughs) recorded history. These were sacred places where one could connect. So to stand there, that's all part of the context, right? Whatever's happening in your life right before you come to Egypt, all of the experiences and trials and wisdom and failures and successes that you've had in your life leading up to that, um, your own beliefs and prejudices and yeah, where your heart's at, all of those things are all part of the context. And for us, like, you know, you saw this on our tour, right? Like, that day one, everybody's inundated with all these symbols and yes. they're overwhelmed, you know, and they're like, ah, I don't get it, you know, mind blown. But as we move 
right? As we go through this progression of, of these places that we're visiting and you're seeing these same things over and over again, maybe even in different ways and different elements presented, it starts to open up. It's to, you, you start making these connections all on your own, right? We don't have to say anything. It really is amazing. I mean, when we started the tour this last time, I said at 12 days, you will be different people. And I was not kidding. Even, even the most Egypt illiterate person started to get a sense of, of things and started to understand it. And like Jared said, it will stir memory. It will stir your heart and your soul. And the heart is such a, such a beautiful symbol in Egypt. Many of you who've studied Egypt, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the weighing of the heart ceremony, the end of, of your probation, your heart is what's weighed against the feather of Ma'at against light and truth. And I happen to love that because, you know, my road to hell is paved with a lot of good intentions and it's in Egypt. It's not a road to hell. It's, it's where my heart is and it's where that devotion is and that love in spite of the practice or the failure to practice, or I love that Egypt transcends that there certainly is ritual. There certainly is a path that's carved out. And I was reading last night because we rent out the great pyramid and we take our group in there, just us, which is such a beautiful experience. But I was reading last night that all of the tombs, sarcophagus, uh, even the great pyramid was built as an embrace. I'd never, I'd never learned that Jared. And that just filled me up that as I'm crawling through the dark and I'm trying to make my way through those tunnels and through those passages and descend and ascend that the whole time I am surrounded by this cosmic embrace. And like you said, that's going to transcend practice and, and ideology and all these other things that maybe get in the way of just true devotion and worship. And that's one of the takeaways for me about the study of Egypt and looking at Egypt and the approach is, it just transcends so much of, of what we get bogged down with. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, you bring up the embrace. I mean, that's, that's critical in Egypt. That is a very powerful component and a pivotal component of the whole thing. You're right. It's everywhere. That idea of an embrace. You'll see Isis with her feathered wings, right? That's just reaching out and embracing her husband. You see the mother goddess embracing her children. She welcomes you back. You see, you embrace your father. You embrace others as you go along. There are a series of ceremonial and ritual embraces that bring one through various gates doors, thresholds, or veils, right? As you pass through each one is, is, you know, there's a series of embraces that brings one further along. I don't know if you remember, we talked about even the uh, coffins, right? Um, it's an embrace. You're going back to your mother. You're going to Nut, right? Nut is that you'll see her depicted just beautiful, beautiful depictions of her, uh, her blue body, her blue starry body, right? She's just spangled with these stars all over her body. And, you know, her arms touch one side and her legs touch the other. She's conceived of as the heavens, as the firmament of the heavens, right? And it's her starry body. And in some of these, the later coffins, they would have carvings or paintings or pictures of Nut on the lid, right? So that as it's closed, it's her. You're going back into your mother's embrace. She's the first one there waiting to, to greet you, right? And to embrace you and to remember and recognize you. That is a critical component for them. You are recognized. And the first one to recognize you is, is your mother, right? Like, yeah, this is my child. And yes, <laughs> he or she belongs with me, you know, and, and brings you back in. And we can say that all day long, but to see it <laughs> and to yeah. feel it in person, it's next level. It's a whole other thing. Yes. Which lends itself to, if you look at facsimile three, the mother behind the throne, there, like Jared just gave you all kinds of insight about she's the one who claims you as her child and knows 
gives you that inheritance. If you want to know aspects about her, that's one beautiful one. And this, this very tender embrace, it's just, it's so beautiful. And you'll see her nursing Pharaoh or nursing her children or bestowing this breath of life or the breath with the ankh or living waters. I mean, she's always giving and, and she's a tree of life. I mean, there's just there's just so much there. When you talk about goddesses and trees, right? And <laughs> tree of life. I mean, that's straight out of Egypt. You find that everywhere. Her in the tree, her as a tree. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. it starts right there. Then that helps you connect dots with maybe some things you're maybe more familiar with. To conclude, I wanted to talk just a teeny bit about Hathor, Jared. And then if you would give us the complimentary, a teeny bit about Amun. The Father God, we haven't we haven't discussed him. I want to show you how there's this beautiful balance between the two. Hathor is is the major personification, I would say, of the Mother Goddess. I'm actually wearing her on my heart. My sister got me this pendant, and this hangs right on my heart, right over my heart, because I love her. And one of her epithets is beautiful of face, Hathor is known as, as beautiful a face. What I came to understand is, as I was with her there in Egypt, is that that beauty lends itself to you. And that beauty makes you courageous and strong and beautiful and fearless in the face of the fight and knowledgeable about who you are and where you came from and who you're part of. And it's just... I felt it just pour through the sand into me. I don't have the words for it, but it's a beauty that transcends time and space, but it's a beauty that inspires. If you think about artists who paint and poets that write and sculptors that sculpt and everything that we have, things that are built, it's her beauty is what inspires that. And and you'll talk a little bit about how it inspires her husband, but it inspires me and it inspires you because it's part of you. Her beauty runs through your veins and that courage and that creation and everything that comes with that is, is part of that. And so I want you to feel that even, even across the airwaves, um, even without seeing her face right in front of you, that I'll put a picture up and I just like you to just think about that one aspect of your mother that is so prominent and beautiful in Egypt. It, it, it's the beauty that inspires and creates and ennobles and empowers and breathes life into very literally eternal life and, and all of these, these amazing things that she is. And she is known as the eye of Ra. She is the eye of her husband. Greek, they would say, uh, Protonoia first thought. His first thought is always of her. And as you watch their interplay, it's actually delightful and beautiful and even playful and full of reverence and awe and devotion and love, absolute loyalty. And so, Jared, what would you love to add to that about her counterpart, Amen, the the hidden one, the king of of all? <laughs> Like we said, you don't get one without the other, and, and, and they go together. And so another name for Amun, visible manifestation is Ra, right? Sometimes it gets, again, oversimplified that the Egyptians worship the sun. Well, it's not the sun. It's just a wonderful symbol for the God who emanates light out into the entire cosmos, right? A God of light and life. That's, that's what we're talking about in the most enormous, incomprehensible uh, way, right? And, and that is part of the case. He's, he's so glorified, right? His, his works are, are not, com- can't be completely comprehended and known by us, right? Hence, he's the veiled one. He's, he's, he's um, unknown. He's hidden. Not to say that you can't have connection with him, that you can't receive direction from him, because they absolutely sought that and expected to have that. So it doesn't mean like completely unknowable. That's not the idea. You still want to rejoin that company and be with them become like them. But in terms of right now, you know, we're limited. We can't understand and we can't know all of his creation. You know, who can number all the worlds that he's created and that he created in concert with 
his wife, right? The, the goddess, the queen that's every bit a part of it. She's the weaver, right? He emanates light. She, well, they emanate light and she weaves with this light. The, the goddess is often depicted weaving, right? Weaving veils, weaving robes of glory, re- weaving bodies for her children, weaving all sorts of things. That's the goddess. Some, sometimes you'll see Hawthorne depicted as a cow, the great celestial cow of the heavens, because it's just completely motherly, right? The cow giving her milk, right? And the Milky Way is an expression of that. You'll see the cow's starry body, again, like the heavens, right? That she returned to her legs, the pillars of the earth. And you'll see her sons and daughters adoring her, worshiping her, loving her. She is the complete embodiment of nurturing, right? Of, Of love and tenderness. They're all of her titles. She has so many titles that, that go along with that. And like we said, Hawthorne can also become the lioness, right? She can become fierce and frightening, even if you're on if you're on the wrong side of that. She is this comforting womb-like space that that, that you want to return to and be renewed by. And then Amon, yeah, when you see Amon with these two towering plumes, these huge feathers or rays of light you know this massive crown he's often depicted uh dark blue or black his skin in terms of like his primordial condition right he's pre- he's way before any of you know any of known this known world right this creation he's pre-existent you might say but sometimes you do find him also colored with the same red skin as they they depict the egyptian men with right because he was a man Right, he's he's an exalted man. That's the idea, and you can join him, and you can bow before him. You can present mat. You talked about that it, having mat in your heart, that light and that truth. When I mentioned earlier, the language, heart. Right, the word for heart is eid. It's heart, uh, spelled differently, but the same sound. So it's it's homophonic. Uh, eid can also mean thirst. <laughs> so. Again, oh, this isn't a coincidence, cool. right? Yeah. yeah. It's meant to teach you something. Like your heart thirsts after this, right? You yearn for it. Like the people that that come on our tours and are going to be listening to this, you have that same homesickness, right? That same yearning for home, that longing for home. And, and in Egypt, you know, you get a taste of home. At least that's what I find. You get a taste of home. And that's why I keep going back. And that's what I hope. Um, those who come with us can experience. Beautifully said. Well, Jared, I am grateful for your time and and your talents. And Jared has heart. His heart is part of, of this study. And I appreciate that about you. We are taking a group in January. There's a few spots left. If any of you are interested, we have an amazing time. Jared and I try to instruct you as best we can. Uh, We do have an Egyptian guide as well to give you some of the other historical background. We'd love to have you join us. I think we're looking at October of next year as well. I don't know what our world will hold. I think the events of the last couple of years have shown that there are no guarantees. We'd love to have you join us if you're not able to join us. Jared's class is remarkable. That's also an option. Frankly, I mean, that's kind of what I designed my class for. If you have no exposure to Egypt, you're now going to get a taste of it. You're now going to be familiar with some of the symbols and the names and such so that you can now approach other sources um, more intelligently, right? And with a different perspective and and familiarity. So, um, but yeah, if you just wanted to use Nibble, yeah, sure. Abraham in Egypt, an approach to the book of Abraham, um, the Joseph Smith of Pyre, and and even uh, the One Eternal Round. Those are all books that that treat um, Egypt and the facsimiles in particular. Not necessarily directly related to Egypt, but Temple in the Cosmos of, of Nibley's is definitely one of my favorites. I love that. That book's taken me about 20 years to be able to read and comprehend in any way. I think it was a couple of years ago. I was like, I think I understood that sentence. All right. It, it, takes, it takes lots and lots of background. It takes a, a lot of context. Work is worth it, right? The effort is Absolutely. worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's what's led us here, actually. We've been studying this for many years. Study is a delicious thing. That thirst is 
to me, it's delicious. And the more I drink, the more filled I am, but the more I have, you know, a deeper thirst, I would say, right. It starts superficially and it, and it goes deeper. So thank you for filling some of our listeners with some of your beautiful words and thoughts. Any last words? No, just, uh, you know, thanks for having me and (laughs) really appreciate it. Appreciate everything that you do, of course. And uh, I love working with you and I hope we can continue to work together. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Jared. To our listeners, I'll close with a beautiful poem called The Initiate by Melanie Cannon, who composed it on our last visit. And Jared and I truly, within the spirit of Ma'at, wish you love and light. The Initiate. The eye of Horus blinks. The dark ibis bows its thin beak. A black beetle scuttles across the red granite threshold. And the sun bursts over Egypt as life into a tomb. A gasp of light and warmth in the alabaster jar of a hazy sky, illuminating the ancient way for travelers. Hathor, will you accept my thrown-up arms? Will my song mingle with the breath of queens? The kiss of my steps be felt on the pavement stones of Dendara? Have I left behind the print of my soul as she has left hers, light as mott feathers on mine? Like lying my body gently into a stone sarcophagus, I have descended into myself, a contemplative folding fan, space and time wrapping around me like the lapis and golden wings of Isis. All I found in the crawling tunnel of my heart is another sphinx's riddle, whispered into an echoing chamber. Will I find her in myself? Will I fly on the hot wind, white scarf flapping as the wings of Pharaoh's birds, pushing against the nets that tried to contain me? Will my face be a billowing cloth sail, catching her breath, a guide through the Nile of my life? May I be a golden bark, rising and falling on the currents of deep waters, making love to mystery with each dip of the oar? Will my home be beauty as the body of Newt? My children the timeless columns of Abu Simbel? Will she open my mouth and my words become symbols? Glyphs speaking through hands, cool pressed against carved stone. Will the moon rise in my chest and cry out as an early morning Adan splitting the cold air? Haya Allah sasalach. Haya Allah sa salach, Haya Allah sa falach. Hurry to the prayer, hurry to salvation. Tongues set me free. Wake me from my honeyed sleep and set me to dance on the edge of the circumpolar stars. No more a painted papyrus crumbling into sand, forgetting who I am, but a sun disk face to the dry wind and brightening sky, reflecting the dawn.